Today on Let the Bible Speak. We begin a series of lessons examining the church that is revealed in the New Testament. Today, its origin and beginning. Good morning and welcome. Today I want to talk about the church we read about in the New Testament. During His earthly ministry, Jesus told His disciples that He would build His church and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. That is to say, death would never thwart the establishment and existence of the church of Christ. The Bible elsewhere tells us that the kingdom of Christ will never be destroyed. So if Jesus built His church and it has not been destroyed, well, it still exists. But what is it? What are its characteristics? What form did the church take when Jesus established it in the days of His apostles? There is much confusion about those things today. For one thing, there are hundreds of organizations across America and around the globe which claim to either be the church or a part of the church. These groups vary in doctrine, practice, name, and structure so much so that it's almost impossible to sort it all out. What we wish to do in a new series of lessons is simply open the Bible and let it speak concerning the church as it existed in the days of the New Testament when the Scriptures were written. For a beginning point, we turn to the words of Jesus to His disciples in Caesarea Philippi recorded in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13 and reading through verse 18. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In the coming weeks we will look at several facets of the church revealed in the New Testament. But today, Lord willing, we want to focus on its origin and beginning. Today's lesson, the origin of the New Testament church, after a song. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV.
The Church of Christ is a prominent theme of Scripture and is the primary object of God's plan for the ages. It is not an insignificant detail in God's program, but rather a central fact in God's scheme. Now, we're not saved by the church. We're saved by Christ. But the saved are in the church, according to Scripture, because God adds all who are saved to it, according to Acts 2, verse 47. Not only that, the word rendered as church in our English Bibles means the called out. It refers to an assembly of saved people an assembly of people who are distinguished from the rest of the people in this lost and perishing world. The church enjoys a special covenantal relationship with God through Christ that those outside of the church do not possess until they are called out of the world by hearing the gospel, believing in and upon obedience to that gospel, are added by the Lord to the church. Now, that very fact alone makes the church a subject worthy of our utmost attention and study. We should not dismiss a study of the church. We should eagerly want to know what the Bible has to say about the church. And it should make us want a desire to be numbered among the church. But it begs the question, what church are we talking about? You know, today folks see the church in different ways, and they describe it in different ways. Most think of it as being made up of varying and conflicting religious organizations who all claim to belong to Christ. Since the Protestant Reformation, those claiming to be the church have been fragmented into an ever-growing and dizzying number of denominations and religious factions. And this has been the case for so long that many take it for granted that this is normal and acceptable to God. Some have turned away from Christianity altogether because of the confusion that exists and all of the division. It seems overwhelming, doesn't it, to stand and survey the religious landscape today and to even try to begin to discern the church of the Bible. Well, I can tell you that that church was not splintered into hundreds of denominations and conflicting organizations. But rather, that church we read about in the New Testament represented one body, eventually made up of people from all ethnic backgrounds and walks of life. The Apostle Paul succinctly stated in Ephesians 4 and verse 4 that there is one body. Now the church existed in the form of many congregations spread across the world, but those congregations did not represent a myriad of denominations and theologies like we supposedly have today. Rather, if the beliefs and practices of a congregation erred from the truth, the apostles quickly set out to correct those errors and bring that church back into line with what was right. It was important that the church speak the same thing and stand for the same truth. That should be our desire today as well, to see the church be what Christ intended for it to be in belief and practice according to what the apostles taught, what they taught that it should be. In this series of lessons, we want to simply look at the church as Christ instituted it, long before the doctrines and traditions of men corrupted it, and we want to see what the New Testament reveals about it. And surely, if we're concerned about truth, and I believe you are, we should all desire to be a part of the church as Christ built it. Now today we want to consider the origin of the New Testament church. Where, when, and how did the church originate? Is it the product of the work and thinking of men? Did it just evolve through time as men set about to shape and mold and make it? Or did it originate with God and was it revealed by God? If it came from God, was it His plan all along or was it just some small detail in His program for mankind? Well, according to the scriptures, the church is a focal point of God's scheme of redemption and His overall plan. In fact, the church is the result of God's saving work in this world. The Apostle Paul made plain the fact that the church was in God's mind from before the dawn of time, and that should tell us how dear and how vital and how important the church is in the eyes of God. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9-11, through 11, Paul describes his mission to the nations like this. He says, to make all men see from the beginning of the, uh, the fellowship of the mystery, I should say, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord." Now let's notice a few points that Paul makes. Number one, 
the scheme of redemption, which Paul refers to as a mystery, that just means that it was hidden from man until the time of its revelation. The scheme of redemption was in the mind of God from the beginning of the ages. Number two, this eternal purpose was accomplished through the work of Jesus Christ in His coming, His life, His death, and His resurrection, and His ascension and enthronement. And number three, this eternal plan is now made known to all, including the forces of the unseen spirit realm, through the church. That is, by the existence of the church. Not by what the church says or does, but by the mere existence of the church. All can see in that the result of God's work through the ages. It's the product of God's redemptive work through the ages of time. So the church did not originate in the minds of men, but rather in the infinite and eternal mind of God. It was in God's purpose all along for Christ to build His church. There is, by the way, a school of thought that essentially says that God came up with the church late in His program after the Jewish nation unexpectedly rejected Christ and His kingdom offer to them. But the Bible doesn't teach that. It teaches the very opposite. God knew all along He would establish the church, and He would build that church out of Jews and Gentiles. Now the church is not only a divine institution, it was in the mind and plan of God from eternity. It should not surprise us then to hear the Old Testament prophets referring to it in their prophecies. For example, Isaiah, 700 years before Christ came, in Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, he said, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem." Now notice he says that in the latter days, and that's a phrase in the Bible which refers to the time beginning with Christ and His coming, and the dispensation in which we now live and have lived since Pentecost, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse, verses 1 and 2 bear that out. But he speaks that in those latter days, this last dispensation of time, the Lord's house would be established. Well, where does God presently dwell with the people on earth? He dwells among His people, the church. The Bible makes that clear. Paul told the church at Corinth that they were the temple of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. He also told Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15 that the house of God is the church of the living God. So Isaiah is looking through his prophetic telescope and he's seeing the establishment of the church in this world. It would supersede all of the kingdoms and institutions of this world in the eyes of God. Now, now then notice that he said that the Lord's house would be established and that subsequently the word of the Lord would go forth out of Zion or out of Jerusalem. Well, this is exactly what occurred beginning on the day of Pentecost, 49 days following Christ's resurrection. Less than a year before Christ went to the cross, He was traveling with His disciples in Caesarea Philippi, and He made the important declaration that He would build His church, and death would not prevent Him from doing so. He elicited a confession on that occasion from the lips of Peter that He was God's Son, sent from God as the Christ. That means God's anointed King. And Jesus said that this was the rock upon which His church would be built. Now I know there are many who believe that Peter himself was the rock Jesus was, refer was referring to, but the original Greek does not bear that out. Jesus used two different words, one meaning a little stone, another a large rock. And his play on words was simply to let Peter, whose name refers to the little stone, that on the great truth he had confessed that Jesus was the king, this church would be constructed. In other words, the church was not built upon Peter. It was built upon the Christhood of Jesus. It was built by Jesus, by God's commission, and upon the truth of the ages that Jesus is King. He is the Christ. Now when people become obedient, and when they have saving faith in that fact, they are added to this great spiritual house, the church. Now not only is Peter not the head of that church, neither is any other man. Jesus alone claims that title. It is His church, for God sent Him to build it, and it constitutes His kingdom in the world that God gave Him to rule over. So when we look at the church of the New Testament, 
we're looking at something that Christ alone had the authority to build and something that only He has the rule over. It is His church and not ours or anyone else's, and we should always in every circumstance remember that. Now then, when did Jesus build His church? When, as Isaiah prophesied, was the Lord's house established? And when, as Jesus promised, did He build His church? When did this church of prophecy become the church in reality? When, where, and how did it begin? Well, notice that Jesus told His disciples that when He built His church, He would grant them the keys to the kingdom. In other words, the promised kingdom would appear when He built His church. Well, what did Jesus say about the coming of His kingdom? Now, there are many who say the kingdom is yet to come. But notice what Jesus said in Mark 9 and verse 1. He said that His kingdom would come in the lifetime of the apostles. He said, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. So the kingdom would be present. It would be in existence within the lifetimes of some living in the first century. That means the church would be established in that same period of time. And the kingdom would come in that same period of time. Jesus said that it would come with power. What power? Well, after the resurrection of Jesus and shortly before His ascension and enthronement in heaven, Jesus told the apostles to wait in Jerusalem and that they would receive power when He sent the Holy Spirit to them. Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. Now then, remember that according to Isaiah, when the Lord's house was established, when the church was built, when the kingdom came, the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. Well, if we can find out when that happens, we can learn when the mountain of the Lord's house was established. Well, notice what happened before Jesus departed for heaven in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. It says, And being assembled with them, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, You have heard from Me. And then in verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the power would come when the Holy Spirit came upon them in Jerusalem. We'll turn the page to chapter 2, and that's exactly what happened. The Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles and endued them with power, which was shown by their speaking in foreign languages that they had never learned. Now once that sign was seen by the people in Jerusalem, Peter then used the keys of the kingdom by preaching the lordship and kingship of Christ, that upon which the church would be built, and he declared the terms of entrance into that kingdom. And we read where thousands responded that day by believing the message Peter preached, by turning from their sins and repentance, by changing their allegiance to Christ as king, by confessing him, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And then see in verse 4 to 7, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So that right there is the grand beginning of the church of Christ, which was planned by God from eternity, prophesied in the Old Testament, brought into existence by Christ, declared by the apostles, and described for us in the New Testament scriptures. That's the church that Jesus built. That's the church we should strive to be a member of. That's the only church that God ever indicated would be, would be built. It was to ultimately include people from all of the nations of the earth. As the gospel spread, that became the case. And in this kingdom was to be united people under the lordship of Jesus Christ who had been reconciled to God through Him in the work of the gospel. Now as the apostles launched out from that first day in Jerusalem, and eventually fanned out across the empire and the world, they preached the same message. Men and women became obedient to that same faith, and they were consequently added to the same church. Those men and women in cities and communities across the world then came together into local assemblies of that church, each of which constituted the body of Christ in that particular place. We read of the church, and we read of people of like precious faith, making up congregations of the church. Now we read about that. But never do we read of any such thing as a denomination. Never in the New Testament do we read of men or women setting out to establish distinct religious bodies representing unique doctrines, theologies, and practices. If anybody did that, it was false teaching. And it was condemned by the apostles, not endorsed by the apostles, because that wasn't God's plan. 
Paul, in fact, on more than one occasion stated that what he taught one church to do, he taught the other churches to do as well. You see, denominations and distinct religious organizations came much later. And when anything akin to or foreshadowing the idea of denominations and sects and factions began to emerge, it was swiftly and soundly condemned by the apostles. For example, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. You know, people today, I'm of Martin Luther, or I'm of John Calvin, I'm of John Smith. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul rebuked those who aligned themselves after any person but Christ. Now, my friend, Christ never instituted a single denomination in this world. He never sanctioned or commissioned anyone to begin a denomination in this world. Denominations represent division. Despite the ecumenical claims we sometimes hear among the denominations, the very existence of such is contrary to the design and plan of Christ and His church. And let me state this, that any religious organization that is larger than a local congregation established through the preaching and reception of the gospel is simply not of God. It is of men, and it should be rejected. We should each desire to simply be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing less and nothing more. And if all people made this their objective, well, the result would be every denomination would fold and fall, and we would begin to move toward the unity that Christ desired and prayed for as He prepared to build His church. Now, Lord willing, as we continue our series next week, we will look to the New Testament, and we will see the form and the organization of the New Testament church. That's very important that we understand how churches were organized and what form they took in the first century. When we speak of the church universally, we're speaking of a relationship that people have to God through Christ. People are saved and they become numbered among this called out people, the church. But in a very visible and local sense, we see congregations springing up and they were organized and formed in a particular fashion. And we're going to notice, Lord willing, the significance of that in our next study. So I hope that you'll plan to join me for that study and tell someone else about it as well. I'll return in a moment to let you know how to get a free copy of today's lesson. But first, here's another song. What an awful
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. I hope that you will plan to be with us as at least for the next five or six weeks we continue in our study on the New Testament church and you'll encourage other people to watch as well. If you would like a free printed transcript of today's lesson, ask for the lesson, The Origin of the Church, and that free copy will be on its way. We appreciate you for joining us. Don't forget you can find other videos, past videos on our YouTube channel as well as our website. Our YouTube channel is Let the Bible Speak TV, and our website is ltbstv.org. We also have a podcast. You can subscribe and listen to us when you walk or run or uh, wherever you may be on the go. We hope that you will join us next time for our next broadcast together, and we'll look forward to seeing you then if God is willing. Until then, have a great week, and may the Lord bless you according to His will. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcasts and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.